Yeah, I guess Mick was right. Um, civil engagement is something that I didn't think would be happening um, so soon in a, in, a, in a country like Egypt. I mean, that's something we have long forgotten, and uh, wow, we're doing it now. So I can't believe I'm standing here excited that this is happening in my country. So um, it is my honor to share with you uh, an experience uh, of the Egyptian Revolution. Um, as an Egyptian who was there and intends to stay there uh, in both my personal capacity and director of AFAS Egypt. Um, although I'm always very tempted to talk about the revolution on um, itself on January the 25th uh, and how it led to the ousting of Mubarak on February 11th, I believe that the truly impressive part uh, was how the civil society and its engagement was the um, backbone or the force underpinning the whole revolution itself, um, keeping it solid and strong. Um, the Egyptian revolution was um, one proudly initiated and fueled by the youth of Egypt and strongly supported by the people and the whole population afterwards. Um, in hope of freedom and in pursuit of democracy, something that um, I personally think was so far away. We, didn't ha we had no idea it could be around the corner. So allow me to draw a picture for you, illustrating what happened behind the scenes during the revolution. Um, it initiated as an event on Facebook a normal event on Facebook, on January 25th. The first thousands of groups of young people gathered in Tahrir Square. They were not taken seriously and were seen as a bunch of kids demonstrating, just like the several other demonstrations before. But this time, there was persistence in demonstrations that stayed in Tahrir Square. And impressively, the numbers grew by the day. As it became possible that this can turn into a true revolution. Thousands and thousands came and joined from all over the country, and the numbers were well over two million by, by in two or three days. The administration, the former government, began to absorb the threat and take it seriously and take aggressive actions with their usual oppressive tools. <coughs> Many tactics were used to put out the raging fire of the demonstrators, or what I would now call the revolutionists. One important tactic was planting fear in the hearts of people through spreading rumors to the population not in Tahrir Square, <laughs> to prevent further build-up and create division among the population. That's a, their classic move. Uh, the rumor being spread was that Egypt was approaching total destruction because of their irresponsible youth sitting there in Tahrir Square, and even worse, if Mubarak leaves now. We were led to believe that. Israel was lining up its army along the Egyptian borders in preparation of an invasion. Gas pipes were exploding in Sinai, and the Bedouins there were asking for independence. US warships were waiting north of Suez Canal, ready to take over our number one source of income, the Suez Canal. The Egyptian pound, our currency, will completely collapse. What is left of the economy will fail. We will go hungry in no time. Tourism, our second largest source of income, is already finished and gone. There is no bread. There is no gas. And these were, um, they disappeared from, from the market. So it was fear, fear, a lot of that. We all know that the most powerful weapon is to scare people for their personal safety, their family, their home, and their life. You can easily do that, especially if you have full control over the media, the radio, newspaper, and even television. And the majority of our population is poor, vulnerable, and poorly educated. Unfortunately for the Mubarak administration, that tactic was not successful enough. Tahrir was still holding up. So another cruel tactic was used, unfortunately again, on the Egyptian people. On Friday the 28th at 4 p.m., the police force pulled out completely from the whole country. 
they simply stopped working and stayed at home by order from the commander-in-chief, Mubarak at the time. Can you begin to imagine what it means to have no police? Well, let me help you. To say the least, it means no operating police stations. It means no 911 emergency numbers. It means no traffic control. It means no guards for embassies. It means no security for churches, synagogues, or mosques. And, and these religious institutions are guarded because we were always led to believe that we have um, religious conflict within our country. It means no security for banks. It means no security for antiquities like the Egyptian Museum, not the guarded at all. It means no secured prisons. Basically, anything that needs securing was now devoured. On that day, mysteriously, all prisons were opened and over 10,000 convicts and prisoners escaped on the streets. Not only that, internet service was cut and there was no cell phone service. And of course, television controlled by the state, airing fearsome pictures and state-directed talk shows playing their part of the fiasco as well. Um, I'm sure some of that was on the news as well, how we were cut from uh, communication completely. So can you imagine a country of 82 million with not one policeman on duty? It's hard to imagine, right? Well, chaos would be the natural expected result of this filthy move. But the incredible happened, truly incredible. People came together, hand in hand, it happened with no coordination or planning. Remember, we had no means of communication with each other. We were completely come off, cut off from each other. It was no organized movement. Civilians formed groups in every neighborhood to guard and protect themselves from the thugs and criminals on the street. They were all young men, uh, the civilians. They were all young men from every home, 14 years and above. They were armed with kitchen knives, <laughs> chains, sticks, whatever they could find at home. These groups monitored the streets day and nights, taking shifts. We are not only talking about Cairo, but the whole country did that instinct. I recall my parents, who are both well over 70 years, with constant tears in their eyes and full of fear. They felt safe and would only calm down when my 15-year-old nephew, their grandson, took shifts with the men in the neighborhood and came home after eight-hour shifts to tell them that they were safe and not to worry sharing stories of the incredible spirit on the streets about civilians and ordinary people coming together to protect one another. Civilians formed a human shield around our precious 100-year-old Egyptian museum, the one that houses the King Tut's solid gold mask and countless treasures. They took shifts day and night for over five days. Youth went out to organize traffic. Remember, the traffic lights were turned off. All traffic lights were turned off. And drivers gladly responded. I'm sorry I don't have pictures for all this because hardly anybody was focusing on documenting. <laughs> Whatever I could get, I, I managed to do. Not one embassy or bank was raided or attacked or put in danger. Churches and synagogues were safe. In fact, Muslims attended church service on Sunday stood in large numbers guarding churches at praying time to show solidarity. Christians formed a shield around Muslims in Tahrir Square as they performed their Friday prayer. That was the picture for that. I could go on and on with stories of what happened during the 11 days of complete police absence. But the even more impressive part is that crime rate and thefts remained only at their usual rates and no more. You could imagine differently with no police at all. I must confess, we surprised ourselves. And from then on, our confidence grew strong, and we knew that we were much more powerful than we could imagine, or rather led to believe during our long years of oppressing, oppressive ruling and dictatorship. The interesting question is who were those people who we saw taking care of us during the police absence? The answer is everyone. Finally, on February 11th, Mubarak steps down, or rather was ousted, under tremendous pressure, but sadly much loss was on the way. But now that I look around me, we had much less loss than my fellow um, 
fighting citizens in Libya and Syria and Yemen. Um, I pray for them, but um, we had losses too, but not compared. So, what happens the next day? The, ne the day next uh, after February 11th when, when Mubarak steps down. Hundreds of youth go out to the streets to clean up Tahrir Square. Again, this was not organized or agreed upon. And in streets all over the country, they went out to paint, beautify, plant, and repair. Some collected and raised funds for those who were affected by the standstill of the economy during the revolution, providing for, for, uh, food for poor people who lost their daily income. People were out in the streets doing whatever they could do. Some youth even went to the pyramids to send the world a message with big signs reading, we have accomplished our internal affairs of cleaning up our country of oppression, so please come back, we are waiting for you. And, um, we were protected, I have to mention this, we were protected by the media that was there. And it was so important for us that the media would stay there because if they had disappeared, we were in trouble. And so the whole world was watching us, and so I just want to say that you were part of the revolution. If you had not been following the revolution and watching so closely, we could not have done it. Um. <laughs> That's an idea. That's not near the pyramid. That was, that was part of it. Oh, and, and I have to mention, so many foreigners were in Tahrir Square taking photographs. I mean, it wasn't dangerous there. It was very peaceful, thank God. On March 19th, well, it doesn't stop there. On March 19th, 20 million Egyptians went to the referendum to agree or disagree on the amendments of the Constitution, a first in the history of Egypt, to see such a large number of people participating in a referendum. I confess, but I have never participated in any election or referendum in my life. I'm not proud, but like most Egyptians, we always knew that it would not make any difference whether we participated or not. The results were always preset. I now feel excited about the future. Like millions of Egyptians, I feel I am responsible for my country. I have a civil responsibility. But it has also come clear to the Egyptians that we have a long way to go in learning about democracy, civil rights, and political participation. You are talking about the deprived population for years and years, longer than you think. I mean, my own children, and so most of you have been born when Mubarak was ruling and have grew up seeing only Mubarak and knowing only Mubarak, and you have no idea when we, at one point we thought he was eternal. I mean, he was, he was 84 and not, nothing was happening to him. He even had black hair. <laughs> Again, this is a role civil society is stepping up to assume, educating our people. NGOs and active volunteers are organizing themselves to make sure this mission is accomplished, to educate, teach, and encourage. Well, in AFS Egypt, our smaller world, we are proud to have played and will continue to play our active role and contribute to the changing face of our country, living up to our core values. To begin with, as, if, uh, as we had to evacuate on January 3rd, evacuate the AFS participants from Egypt. Volunteers were stepping up everywhere to support, drive to the airport, provide accommodation near the airport, collect luggage or whatever was needed. Here I would like to mention that it was hard for us to evacuate our precious students, but we had no idea what was coming next, and safety of students always comes first in AFS. Well, having taken care of our participants and knowing that they were all safely back home in their countries, we shifted our attention to our revolution. As I spent my days in Tahrir Square, I was happy to be bumping into our AFS volunteers all the time. Returnees, some of whom were even camping there, were ready to do whatever it took. They were simply applying what they learned during their AFS abroad, expressing themselves clearly and speaking up. My own son, who is also an AFS returnee, was there with his little tent set up, solid as a rock, right in the middle of Tahrir Square. He had a little sign on his tent that read, Motel of Freedom. <laughs> I couldn't get a picture of that. 
Like millions of others, he did not leave until February 11, when Mubarak was ousted and the first mission accomplished. But he knew that it was only the beginning, that there was a long road ahead of him in his fight for freedom. Well, naturally, AFS volunteers were among the very first on the next day to clean up, to organize blood drives. Um, and volunteer with the Egyptian food bank in relief efforts, and much more. And now, we have formed groups and teams that will be visiting chapters, organizing large gatherings, whatever we can, with program and agenda, trying to raise political awareness and educate people about their rights their newfound dignity, and their freedom. We have parliamentary elections in September and presidential elections 60 days after, so we have so much to do in such a short time, and we must all put our hands together. By this humble participation, we are only living up to our core <coughs> values in AFS. AFS enables people to act as responsible global citizens, working for peace and understanding in a diverse world. It acknowledges that peace is a dynamic concept threatened by just injustice, inequity, and intolerance. AFS seeks to affirm faith in the dignity and worth of every human being, and for all nations and cultures, it encourages respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms, without distinction as to race, sex, language, religion, or social status. That is so true for our revolution. AFS Egypt is proud to resume hosting programs so soon, but of course with much less numbers. But we have to start somewhere. Um, we are hosting two participants this summer as opposed to 65 last summer, and seven on the school program next semester as, a poor, as opposed to 67. We are optimistic though. We affirm that there's a price to pay for our freedom and we are happy to pay it and start again in the rebuilding. We are happy that we are receiving those young people. They will be joining us at a very interesting time in the history of Egypt and the world and, be, and will be part of our history. History is being made and in a very peaceful way, very unique in world history. Please be sure that we will take good care of every one of them. In Egypt, we need to share our success. We need to. We need to help to rebuild Egypt and would like to do so with interested participants. Please know that our volunteers and host families are eager to resume programs. Full course. Well, now back to civil engagement. The Egyptian Revolution is a perfect example of a movement initiated and driven by youth. Their ownership and responsibility and engagement in their society and their country. The even better example is what resulted from the complete withdrawal of police force. The intention was to bring chaos, but it only brought out people's human nature of social responsibility. True, this sense of responsibility was dormant for so many years, but it was there, it was inside them, it's human nature. It, it can be argued that what happened was survival instinct, inaction as a result of threat of personal safety. But what, can, what came after, the rebuilding, the will to start over again, the optimism and impressive massive actions taken cannot be seen as driven by survival instinct. It is true civil responsibility and engagement which comes natural to any human being, but probably only needed triggering. In Egypt it was a revolution, a shocking event that triggered this human nature to come out strong. In Japan's catastrophic earthquake and tsunami, we have been hearing incredible moving stories of civil engagement. German history is full of shocking events and from this land. Some perfect examples that display how a civil society can be key in building and changing the face of a nation. The whole world looks up to Germany for how its people have moved it through history to be one of the leading nations of the world in record time. They felt responsible and they were confident that they could change the world, even one person at a time. They came with the remarkable idea, uh, they came up with the remarkable idea of youth exchanges to promote peace. Following in their footsteps, we should all be confident in the same way. This is the perfect 
an inspiring example of social responsibility. <laughs> civil engagement and civil responsibility is what kept Egypt in one piece. It is the secret of the success of the revolution and hopefully the success of the next steps towards a better future. Finally, I share, as I share our humble experience, and so I say to you, get involved. Take initiative. It doesn't matter if you're young or old. It doesn't matter if you are one person, a small group, or a whole population. Know that you are owners of and responsible for your family, your community, your country, your continent, and most important of all, the whole world. Know that you are powerful. You can move mountains. We did it. I mean, Egypt did it. <laughs> you didn't believe that. So, dear friends, our revolution is not over yet, so please continue to pray for us. And thank you.